Well, good morning, church. How's everybody today? You're all looking fantastic. All right. Let's stand together. Let's give praise to the King and bless his name.
you may be seated in his presence. It's great to see everybody here. We're thankful for those children that come and worship with us. Aren't we thankful for their beautiful faces? Amen. 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 We praise God for them. Yeah. Yeah, we can for them. Yeah. What a joy to have them here with us. <laughs> Let me cover a few uh, brief announcements. First of all, the church council is meeting tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. Right after the Good News Club, 7.30. We'll meet in the back room, choir room. The Good News Club and JYC continue to meet. We'll be meeting tomorrow night, 5.30 to 7.30. Still got pizza, still got Bible stories. And we're going to have a little skit tomorrow night, a little skit going on. So something different for the kids, all right? And then we have prayer meetings Tuesdays at 9 a.m. We've been really having wonderful meetings. And uh, we pray about... Any needs get brought to us, we pray on them. I mean, we push on those things, and we just watch God answering, answering, answering prayers. Amazing stuff is happening. So continue to uh, to come, uh, those who are able to come at 9 on Tuesdays, and then uh, right after is 10.30 is our first Bible study. We are studying Blessed to be Chosen, Blessed to be Chosen. I still have a couple of books. If you're interested in the study, come. And uh, we're having a good time with that, some good study the discussion time. Um, we're having a new members class today right after the service at 11.15. Meet us in the first, the large classroom, which when you come through the double glass doors and turn right, that's the first, go oh, past the bathroom, don't go in there, but, well, you can, I mean, you can eat, but that's the first big classroom on the right, okay? Uh, we'll meet there at 11.15. The United Women in Faith are going to meet on Thursday, October 6th. That's this Thursday already. October 6th is this Thursday. At noon for a covered dish lunch and planning meeting for the fall festival. All the church women are invited. Then I have two uh, other things I want to highlight to you. Um, first of all, the Crop Hunger Walk is scheduled for Sunday, October 16th, two weeks from today. Um, if you would like to walk, if you're interested in doing the walk, it starts in Ouigo at, uh, I think, at the Baptist Church, ends at the Presbyterian Church, I think it's something like that. And if you're interested in walking, you can see Lila, she'll get information to you. If you have a team of people and you want to walk, that's fine. We're also taking donations, and there's baskets set up in the back. It's over here, okay, it's over here. Uh, we have a, a basket set up for donations if you'd like to give to the Crop Hunger Walk, and it just helps people locally in our area who are uh, struggling right now. And then we're planning a church work day. Uh, how many own a pair of coveralls? I'm just wondering. Any coverall owners out there? Uh, two of you. Okay. How many of you own blue jeans? Come on. Come on. Be honest. How many of you do work in other clothes? You, you, okay, you wear your Sunday best. That's fine. That's fine. Whatever you work in, put them on and show up here. We could really use it. Okay, October 15th. It's a Saturday, 9 a.m. till noon. Just three hours, but when we get a whole team of people together, man, it's amazing what we can get done. So we hope you'll come. Put your coveralls, jeans, or Sunday vest on and come and work, okay? And uh, we'll see what we can do and knock out these jobs that need to be done. There is a checklist on the bulletin board. You can sign up. And uh, in fact, Lila even told me that if you see a job on there that you need to do and you're tied up on Saturday, you can come on Friday and do your job, or you can come another day and do your job. It's okay. We're not picky. You know, we're not picky. <laughs> and then we want you to save the date. Our annual Fall Harvest Supper is coming Saturday, November 5th, and so please keep that in mind. That is also the day of our church conference, our church conference. And so a lot going on, lots of things going on. Are there any other announcements that we need to mention? Anything else? Yes. Um, the women are having a high on low sale yes, on Saturday you. from 1 to 4. Homemade pie and ice cream. Really? You're going to miss that. So come <laughs> and uh, get your homemade pie and ice cream on Saturday at 1 o'clock. So 
see, after you finish working at the church and getting all your projects done, you're going to be famished, and so you're going to be ready for pie a la mode, aren't you? I knew that. I knew that, but, but, but even on a different day. It's, it's different day. Have your pies here by 10, 30, 11. That's October 8th, isn't it? That's October 8th. So, so eat the pie so you'll have energy the following Saturday. That's what I meant to say. That's what I meant to say. Okay. Okay. Yeah, amen. All right. If there are no other announcements or any other criticisms, let's go ahead and <laughs> sing our, our hymn together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Let's stand and sing together. Let's pause for just a moment for prayer, please. Father, in this busy, crazy, upside-down world, we thank you that we have a connection to you, the creator of the universe, and that we can know you, we can call upon you. In fact, you welcome us, you invite us, you urge us to come into your presence and to call upon you. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God of the invisible, out of Nothing, you created everything that we can see. And we thank you that you are still not only aware of your creation, but very intricately involved in everything that's happening around us. We thank you for that. We thank you that you're here with us even when there is trouble. And we thank you for being with the folks in Florida. We pray for folks like the folks in Fort Myers where 80% of the town was destroyed. We pray for those folks. We pray for uh, souls that are trying to find their way and rebuild and restart their life. And we pray that you administer to those who are hurting following this tremendous show of power from uh, from the wind and the waves that came crashing in. We pray for those who are scrambling to re rebuild and restart their life. We pray that you will uh, continue to minister to them. We pray for those who are suffering in Ukraine as this war drags on and, and the heartbreak and the separations and the loss of life and the loss of homes and the food shortages and everything else that's happening, refugees fleeing. We are aware as we are sitting here in a very comfortable place and a very peaceful place that there are those who do not have the things we have this morning, and so we pray for them. We pray that you'll be with those people who have suffered such losses and that you will come close to them. And we pray, Lord, that you will reveal yourself to them. For those who don't know Christ, that they would come to know there is a God in heaven who does see when horrible things happen in our life, and he does care about us. We thank you for the word in 1 Peter 5, 7, where he said, Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. And we pray, Lord, that we would do, as Paul wrote in Galatians, that we would bear one another's burdens, and that as we see other people struggling, that we would come and lift up their heavy burden, that we would walk beside them, that we can do our part to minister to them and to show the love of Christ to them. So guide us in these days. We pray that you'd be with America. We pray that you would be... Uh, with us in this hour when it seems that there is uh, much that seems upside down with our world, we're asking you to come, Lord, and we're asking for a move of the Holy Spirit upon America. Uh, nothing can really save people's lives, nothing can certainly save their soul but Jesus. So I pray that you come. 
Lord, reveal yourself and draw your people close to you and help them. And I pray that many more will come to know Christ in the days ahead and that you help us to be faithful with our walk and with our message. We thank you for being with us here. We pray for the weeks ahead and for uh, changes that are coming and a transition that's coming. Help us in this hour, Lord. I pray that everything will come together as you have intended, that it will bring honor to you and that you will guide uh, this church as uh, decisions are being made in the weeks ahead. May your spirit be with us to lead us and you guide us safely to that place where you've called us to be. We commit this service to you, this time to you. We continue to pray for those in need around us. We lift up those on our prayer list, the long, long list of names and concerns, and we continue to remember them before you. We know there are those who are battling cancer and need a healing. We know there are folks who are recovering from accidents that have happened, and they still need our help. We pray for Andrew as he is recovering and coming home on Wednesday. We thank you for the good progress he has made. And we continue to pray. We pray for our friend Grace Sherwood as she faces surgery coming up in another week or two. And for others, Lord, that are on our hearts, we pray that you will heal and strengthen and deliver them. We commit all these prayers to you in the name of Jesus, remembering together the prayer that he has taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I thought this morning we might try a song together. That uh, This is an oldie, an old worship chorus that I... I think you may know it, and if you don't know it, I bet you can learn it pretty quickly. The words say, in my life, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my life, Lord, be glorified today. All right? That's pretty simple, right? Everybody got that? Let's try it together. Make it your prayer. 
some of those old choruses are the best. Yeah. Simple. And they say, you know, really what's on your heart. Okay. All right. Well, the plane's captain made an announcement on the intercom. And he said to the passengers, the number four engine has been shut off because of mechanical trouble. There's nothing to worry about, however. We can still finish the flight with just three engines. Besides, you'll be reassured to know that we have four pastors on board. One passenger called the flight attendant and said, would you please tell the captain I would rather have four engines and three pastor pastors on board. There was an older lady who was busy at home one day when a knock was heard at the door. And upon opening the door, she was greeted by a five-year-old girl and a four-year-old little boy who lived in the neighborhood. Well, the little girl stated that she and her husband were stopping in for a visit. Well, the lady decided to play along, and so she welcomed them, of course, into her home. She invited them into the living room and took them to the sofa as if they were grown-ups. And she seated them there and said, could I offer you some lemonade and cookies? Well, they said that would be very nice. And so she did, and they enjoyed the cookies and the lemonade and some small talk. And then the lady asked them, would you like some more? And the little girl then said, no, thank you. We really must be leaving now. My husband has just wet his pants. <laughs> Isn't life just filled with stressful situations? <laughs> From airplane engine failures to bladder failures, we human beings have to deal with a lot of stuff on any given day. Well, what is the spiritual answer to all of the stress of life? Well, the Apostle Paul reminds us in this third chapter of Colossians. And I have entitled this message, Almost Home. Chapter 3 and verse 1. Paul writes, since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. Now, to put these verses into context, you may remember that several weeks ago now, we studied chapter 2, and in that chapter, Paul was relating four things that we need to recognize and keep in check so that they do not become an idol in our life. You might remember there were four isms that we talked about, and we'll just quickly touch on them again this morning. They were intellectualism, legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. So we're going to talk about those just briefly. The reason I reference them again as we come to chapter 3 is that Paul is really laying the groundwork for what is real in chapter 3 by telling us what is false in chapter 2. Paul is saying in chapter 2 that people get caught up in these worldly traps that the enemy has set for them. And the first one we'll look at, he said, was intellectualism. And people find that they can increase their learning. And they begin to put their trust then in their Intellect, And I've seen this happen, especially people who uh, go on for higher education. Sometimes it can be a trap. Sometimes people can get caught up in all that they've learned and they aren't putting their trust in God. They're putting their trust in their intellect. But my friend, your intellect cannot save you. And we've looked at the falsehood of people who try to intellectualize the word of God and say, well... We know that certain scriptures are not for today. We can dismiss those. We don't have to worry about them. We're not going to pay attention to that. But God has said, this is my word, and I give it to you, and I will honor my word above my name. And so God is hardly ready to dismiss any scriptures. And in fact, if he were interested in communicating that message, I'm quite sure that Jesus Christ would have told us so. Secondly, we come to legalism. People recognize the need for self-governance, and they 
put their trust in a series, a system of rules, and they carry it to an extreme. And when they do, we call it legalism. You'll remember that Jesus had some very harsh words for the Pharisees who were caught up in legalism, all these rules. And if, uh, if the rule was you cannot touch this pulpit, then they would put what was called a fence around that and say, not only can you not touch the pulpit, you can't stand on the platform. Not only can you not stand on the platform, you can't even be in the sanctuary. And it seemed that all their rules were, were just way out of line, and so Jesus called them on that. That's uh, legalism. Thirdly, we come to an awareness of the eternal world, and this caught the attention of a third group of people, and this group got caught up in these mystical experiences with God, and they began to then idolize their experiences, even over the clear teaching of God's Word. And when God's Word revealed a certain thing was true, they would say, yeah, but I had this experience, and I was, I was floating on a cloud, and I remember seeing this, and I know it's true. But if it contradicts the Word of God, our founder, John Wesley, said, if your experience contradicts the Word of God, you throw out your experience. Go by the Word. And so this kind of teaching, mysticism, eventually leads people away from the Creator and into the realm of confusion and darkness. And we know that it is the devil is the author of confusion. And then a fourth group of people went in the opposite direction and realized that just as the body of an athlete can be trained and build muscle and increase speed to compete and win, well, they took bodily discipline to the extreme as they began to worship the severe punishment of the body. Great lengths they would go to, great rituals they would go to to punish their body to show God how sincere they were. And Paul said, neither is there any wisdom in this. And so simply come, take the word of God for what it says, live by its precepts, and you cannot go wrong. It's almost as if God wrote it down and gave it to you so you'd know how to live or something. Uh, that is exactly what God did. And his word will never lead you astray. And so Paul summarizes all of this and he says, look, this world just isn't where it's at. All of these experiences that amplify your flesh are going to leave you empty. This world is not the reality. This world is only temporary. But lasting reality is found in the person of Jesus Christ, in the kingdom that he comes to establish, and in the new heavens and new earth that he will build when the kingdom age is over. Set your sights on heaven. Listen to the words again, verses 1 and 2. Since you've been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights. Notice the wording on the realities, the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. It was author C.S. Lewis in his book, Mirror Christianity, who made this famous statement. He said, quote, If I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world, end quote. And so C.S. Lewis understood. There's a yearning inside of me, an ache for something more. I know I was created for more. And truly the word of God shows me what it was that is coming. It shows me what I was created for. A certain group of scientists have told us over the years that unless you can verify something with your physical senses, unless you can see and touch those things around you, why, you could never put your trust in things you cannot see. But Paul is saying just the opposite this morning. People of faith have their sights on the reality of heaven, and they are longing and aching for that time to be in the presence of God. And this physical world that the scientists, certain scientists think is so uh, perfect and will never pass away, well, my friend, it's all going to pass away. If you'll allow me, I would like to reprise just a little of my personal story for you. And I share this really 
I guess, to talk about the fact that life is temporary and that we all face our trials. Everyone faces trials and trouble in this world, things you weren't expecting. I was born William Lee Rouse, the son of Edwin and Louise Rouse in Endicott, New York, many, many years ago. Don't laugh at that, that's not funny. <laughs> but by the time I was three years old, I had been officially adopted by a loving couple who lived out in the country, George and Maud Pucky, and my name was changed. And though I was too little to remember it, we were brought into their home and a new life began, and my older sister, April, who was adopted with me, us two were adopted together, she remembered that transition, and she was in kindergarten, actually, as April Rouse, when her name was changed to April Pucky, and so she remembered all of this. I grew up in a Christian home. My parents took me to the Little Methodist Church in North Fenton, New York. And later they took me to the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church in Fort Crane, New York. And I remember thinking as a little boy, I, I had such a happy life. And, and uh, I thought to myself, you know, I'm always going to have life like this. I'll always have my parents and my toys and my happy home on the corner of Bear Town and Monkey Run Roads, and I know that it will be this way forever. <sighs> but the years went by. My peaceful little world began to change. In my senior year of high school, my father retired from his job and my happy little home on Bear Town and Monkey Run Roads was put up for sale. And we moved down close to the state park, Shenango Valley State Park, and we lived there in the years that followed. And then I watched as the next couple years went by, and just before my 21st birthday, my father had been having major health issues, and just before I turned 21, he passed away. My sister had married by that time. She had moved out of the house, and that left me now, the man of the house, living alone with a grieving mother, trying to study in Bible college, coming home night after night with her in tears, broken and hurting. And I just didn't know, other than to encourage her in the Lord, I didn't know what to do for her. Well, the same year I graduated college, I got married. And four years later, a son came along. And I thought, finally, I had found peace and security and that the, finally the world would be right and would never change again. I had set my course. But by the time my son had reached seven years old, my, my wife would have taken off with someone else. I would be divorced and he would be living in Texas with his mother just a mere 1,700 miles away. And the sadness and the loneliness came back and the brokenness of life hit me again. You know, it seemed that the more I sought for lasting peace and security in this world, the more it eluded me. Well, by God's grace, my path finally crossed one night with a path of a sweet, lovely young thing named Heidi Burkholder. <laughs> and a relationship ensued that began to restore a sense of peace and relief and hope to my heart that perhaps my upside-down world might finally be getting turned right side up. I experienced the joy of being able to adopt her two boys, Jason and Corey, as my own, and having the opportunity to raise them and be a dad to them. And then our daughter Elizabeth came along, and an even greater sense of peace and of purpose came to me. But then in as the years passed, my mother passed away, and my kids all grew up and moved out of the house on their own. We were in the middle of itinerant ministry, moving from place to place. I was a Methodist pastor, and Heidi and I have served six different pastors over pastorates over 30 years. But the house on the corner of Bear Town and Monkey Run Road now is a distant memory and the years of my childhood that I shared with my mom and dad are fading. And now as I approach my middle 60s, I wonder to myself, was all of that even real or was it just a mirage? It just seems like a dream. And as I ponder that thought, 
And I read in Colossians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul speaks this further word. Verse number 3. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all his glory. As I ponder those words, I realize that, no, it wasn't a mirage, it really happened, but yet, in comparison to what's coming, why these years on earth are just small and fleeting, the, the greater reality is the one that's coming. This life is all about loss, my friend. You're going to suffer many losses, many changes, many transitions. It's not easy to live in this world. But Jesus said, Father, I ask you to protect them. They are not of this world any more than I'm of this world. And we have a Savior who's gone into the heavenly realms and he is preparing a place there for us. And all of that is the reality that is before you, my friend. And if you're going to look too long at this world, you're going to see more sadness than you want to see. Over the last few years, I have lost a sister I grew up with. And I've lost two of my brothers. My brother Ray had been a pastor for 50, excuse me, 50 years. He had been a close friend and a confidant to me. He passed away suddenly last year. I never had a chance to say goodbye. I also lost two uncles just last year who died within days of each other. One of them was like a father to me, and his passing left a huge hole in my heart. Author John Corson says that there are three ways that God gets us invested in heaven. He said, first, we live for heaven through that which we treasure. Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And when Jesus tells us to lay up treasure in heaven, it's not God's way of raising money. It's his way of raising our hearts and minds out of this world and up into heaven. Your heart follows your treasure. So one of the ways we get our hearts on things above is by investing in the kingdom. Second, we live for heaven through our trials. I am convinced God will send a trial a day your way just to keep you homesick for heaven. If he didn't, we would become bound up in this earth and would miss out eternally on what he has in store for us. And the third way that the Lord gets me to set my heart and mind on things above is by transfers. When the people we love precede us into heaven, this process is very important because when you have transferred parents and friends and spouses into heaven, your heart longs to be there all the more keenly. Treasures, trials, and transfers are three ways our hearts can be constantly set on things above. I remember when I was pastoring down in a little town called Newton, Pennsylvania, just outside Clark Summit. And I had an elderly gentleman, and this was a, an unusual thing, but he had been in the same church uh, for 40 years, pastored the same little church in a little town in Pennsylvania for 40 years. And uh, his name was Bill. Help me remember his name. I forgot another guy's name, Bill, by the way. I'm just saying. But usually I remember that. But I remember my friend Bill, and he, he was in his 80s when we were pastoring there. But he still, he just, the love of the Lord was in his heart every minute of the day. And he, so when I would have to take a week off, I invited him to share. Sometimes I invited him to share. And I, I remember that he preached one Sunday, and I got to be in the service and hear him speak. And, he talked, the title of his message was Being Homesick. I still remember to this day how his heart was so longing to go home. And I remember he talked about people he loved and how they had been transferred. And he 
talked about the beauties of the kingdom and, and all the things that he was looking forward to. And now in his 80s, he was struggling, you know, physically he was struggling. He didn't have that same fire he used to have, but the, the light of Jesus was still in his eyes. And it wasn't too many months after he preached that message about being homesick that he went home. Back in the 1970s, there was a group called the Pat Terry Group, and I love their music, and I still have several of their songs that I listen to from time to time. And one song was written by Pat, he entitled it, Home Where I Belong, and the words go like this. They say that heaven's pretty, and living here is too. But if they said that I would have to choose between the two, I go home, going home, where I belong. Sometimes when I'm dreaming, it comes as no surprise that if you look, you'll see that homesick feeling in my eyes. I'm going home, going home, where I belong. While I'm here, I'll serve him gladly and sing him all these songs. I'm here, but not for long. And when I'm feeling lonely, and when I'm feeling blue, it's such a joy to know that I'm only passing through. I'm headed home. I'm headed home where I belong. And one day I'll be sleeping when death knocks on my door. And I'll awake to find that I'm not homesick anymore. Because I'll be home. I'll be home where I belong. Heaven is the place where my biological parents are this morning. It's the place where my adoptive parents are this morning. It's the place where my brothers and my sisters are, where my uh, many relatives, my uncles who I dearly love, and so many others, my aunts and so many others are. They are there along with all of the saints that I have read about in the Bible and throughout all of history, all the saints who have lived and die. And I believe that heaven is a place of incredible rejoicing. And one day I will join them. I'll be home where I belong. And my friend, you can too. Would you bow your head with me for prayer? Let me ask you this morning, you who are seated here in the audience or those who are watching on Facebook Live, are you headed home? Do you know that heaven is your destination? Do you know that you're going to be reunited with loved ones there? You can have that assurance if you'll simply invite Jesus Christ into your heart. He died on the cross to pay the debt for your sins. And if you're ready to turn from your sinful life and surrender your heart to him, he will forgive you everything everything and give you a brand new start with him all you have to do is ask him you can just pray this prayer right along with me and just say Lord Jesus I surrender my life to you I am a sinner and I'm in need of a savior I want to be in your forever home but I know that my sins are going to keep me from it unless I will come to you and ask for your help. And so I thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for rising from the dead to prove you were God in the flesh. And thank you that you have promised to come again to take me to be home with you. Lord, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, for any that prayed that prayer, I ask you to give them simply a peace and assurance that you heard them. You did all the hard work for them. All you ask is that they come and receive the gift you give.
Thank you for the hope of heaven. Thank you for all that is before us that the devil can never take away from us. Thank you for the realities of heaven this day. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we come to the communion table with a full assurance because we know that this Savior came. We know he was who he said he was because he did things no one but God could do. He, he knew things that no one but God could know. He healed every disease, every sickness, every malady, every deformity. He did something no one had ever done before, laying his hands on lepers and making them whole. Never had such things been done. He was crucified for what he taught and preached. He died on an old rugged cross. His body was placed in a tomb. And then he did the impossible one more time by rising from the dead. He is the Lord of heaven and earth. He is the one who changes people's lives. And one of the great joys I've had through the years in all the places we've been is to be able to bring this message and see people connect to him and then watch their life change. I get more excited seeing people's lives change than even seeing people come to faith in Christ. That's the truth. I love to see people grow. And I want to share with you about two little boys who came forward in our Good News Club. They had prayed to receive Christ either last year or the year before, these two young boys. And, and uh, uh, the one boy came up to me his first uh, week back at Good News Club. He came and said, Pastor Bill, how are you doing? And I said, oh, hi. Zachary, good to see him. And we had a little moment there. He was so happy to be back. And so he and his friend came forward. When we give the invitation at the end of the teaching time, and we give an invitation, if you'd like to ask Jesus into your heart, just come and sit right up in the front here, and we'll take time, and we'll go through it all with you and pray with you. Or if you have another need, in your life, you can come. Well, these two little boys came together. Zachary and his friend, they came and they sat down. And uh, so I said to them, I said, what brings you forward? What, what would you like to do tonight? And Zachary was the one who spoke and he said, well, I'd like to ask Jesus into my heart and ask him to forgive me. And I said, well, Zachary, we prayed a while back and you already did that. You asked Jesus to be your Savior. And so Malachi was the other. I said, Malachi, you did also. And Zachary said, yeah, I know. And I said, has something happened that's making you doubt or making you feel like you need to do it again? He said, yes. And so he began to share with me that there was an event happened, something precious that he had received got broken. His little brother was a part of that. And he began to berate his brother. His little brother was mean to him. And it was really weighing heavy on his heart. You know someone knows the Lord when they're being brought under conviction for something they know isn't right. That's not a bad thing. That's how it's supposed to work. It's called growing in Christ. And so he shared that story with me. And then I asked the other young man, I said, now what's bothering you? And he began to share with me that his issue was a different issue, but uh, he had disappointed his mom and she was struggling as it was and he wasn't helping her very much and he felt terrible for the way he acted and he wanted to get right with the Lord. And so what a beautiful moment we had. And, and I said to each of those boys, I said, listen, you, you confess to me. And I said, listen, this is what the Bible says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I said, here's what I'd like you to do. Just the way you've told me, I want you to now pray and tell the Lord what's happened and ask him to forgive you. Well, I'm telling you, those two boys led the most beautiful prayers from their heart that you'd ever hear. It just melted my heart listening to them. Beautiful prayers of repentance, asking God, please forgive me. I know what I did wasn't right. I'm sorry. It was just a beautiful moment. And then Christine was there, and Christine prayed for those boys afterward. And it was just a moment. And so we had that moment together, and they got up, and they started walking down this aisle here and heading down to their classes. And all of a sudden, Zachary stopped in the middle of the aisle and turned around, and he said, Man, I feel so much better. <laughs> I thought, 
That's perfect. That's exactly what's supposed to be happening. You know, you and I have been cleansed. All of our sins washed away. But don't think for a moment that it didn't come at a very high price. And we have a Savior so compassionate, so loving, that He looked past all of our sin, looked to the heart that He saw in us and said, this one is worth saving. I'm going to die for them. That's how much He values you this morning. Coming to this communion table is just a time to remember not how bad you were, not how bad you are, but how valuable you are, how much you're loved by the Lord. That's what communion is for. He did all of this because you are valuable to him. You are everything to him. And he was willing to lay his life down, die on the cross, and rise from the dead to prove you don't ever have to be afraid again. I am with you and I will never leave you. And so the scripture tells us that it was on the night he was betrayed that Jesus took bread and when he had blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This bread is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup and when he had blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and drink from this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And he went on to tell them, I will not drink from this cup again. Not until I drink it with all of you in my Father's kingdom. Jesus is waiting for that day when we will all be in his presence. And for the first time since he left this earth, he will sit down with you and with me and with all those he has loved and died for. And together we will take and drink the cup of salvation. What a day that's going to be. And so church, let's pause. Let's take a few moments. The Bible says we're to search our hearts before we come to this table. If there's anything in your life, like two little boys who sat here, maybe you can say, Pastor, there's some things I'm not too proud of that have happened in the last few weeks, and I think I need to pray about them. So let's take a few moments for silent prayer, and then we will continue. Father, we humble ourselves in your presence. Your presence is what makes this more than just a meal. We are on holy ground with you. We thank you that you still come to cleanse us of our sins, to wash them. You still come to heal us and to help us. Our souls may be fully redeemed, but our bodies are not. And you call us in this place where we are in between, waiting for the redemption of our bodies, but keeping our eyes on the shepherd. And so, Lord, would you forgive us, would you cleanse us, wash us clean once again, Father, as we consecrate these elements and set them apart for your holy purposes, remind us that as we partake of the bread and cup as those first disciples did, it's still your presence that makes this powerful and true. So come and minister to your people. And as we partake, 
of these elements. Fill us again with the Holy Spirit. And help us start a new in our walk with you. We ask these things in Christ's holy and precious name. Amen. I want to invite the servers to make their way to the front now, please. We're going to be receiving this morning by intention. So there's two ways you can do this. You can take a piece of bread and then come over and just dip it into the cup and partake. Or you can take a pre-packaged uh, set that's here. You can avail yourself of that if you prefer that. But either way, it's the Lord's preparation for us. It's the Lord's blessing upon it. And so come and partake of all he has done. I'm going to ask you to come down the center and go off the side. So come down the center and go off the side.
such a simple act, but so full of meaning. Let's stand and sing the closing hymn. We're going to sing about heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. the day is quickly coming when you're going to see his face and all the sorrows of earth will be gone and all of the beauty of his kingdom will be upon you what a day is coming only hold fast your faith and never be ashamed of the gospel of christ amen